All right, good morning. It's awesome to see such smiley faces when things in this world are crazy at times, right? But God is always good. He's always faithful. Amen? Luke chapter 5 this morning, Luke 5, and we'll be studying verses 17 through 26, which includes, you probably could have guessed it, another miraculous event in a person's life by our powerful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, but unlike the man with leprosy we covered last week, who could have resembled the walking dead in the way he looked and was treated, today the passage centers on one who was laid out almost like he was dead. Today, Jesus works in the life of a man who was paralyzed, one who was fully dependent on the goodwill and kindness of others to do anything. And it's a good thing this man had some great friends, (laughs) because their determination helped change this man's life forever. As they used innovation and creativity to knock down the roof of a house to get this man to Jesus. All I have to say is if you are one of those people who likes those home renovation TV shows? Well, you got one today for sure. Even better. Well, at least the demo part, because that's what we see today. But there's actually more to this story. This is the first time in Luke's gospel we see Jesus face opposition from the religious establishment. A very significant passage this morning. Let's, let's read through the accounts, pray, and see what the Lord has for us. Beginning in verse 17 of Luke chapter 5, Luke writes about Jesus and says, Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling, into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he was been, had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Yes, they did. Lord, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for this time together in your house. I pray, Lord, for refreshments. I pray for a revival in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would know that you're on the throne. Lord, I even lift up, I I just pray that church in agreement would just be, Lord, we pray for Israel. Lord, know that all that's going on over there, Lord, just hearing things. We know, God, that you have precious promises, even for them, Lord, and still for them. And, and I just ask, God, that you would uh, just protect those out there, give wisdom to the leaders, Lord, give wisdom to our leaders. Um, and I just pray, God, Lord, as we turn towards your word and focus on you, that you would just open this up to us, Lord. I just pray that, Lord, we know that this doesn't return void, that you have something for us, each one of us, as we look at this, I believe, beautiful example of your love, Lord. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What a passage, right? <laughs> You know, it's a passage about Jesus' miraculous healing power, of course, his compassion, his confrontation with critics, but also his authority to forgive sins. But picking up from where we left off last week, news of Jesus has been spreading rapidly. And though multitudes had already been following him, those multitudes multiplied. As verse 15 from our previous passage stated that there was not just a multitude, but great multitudes of people who came out to see Jesus. Mark tells us that the man who was cleansed from his leprosy contributed to this by being Mr. Big Mouth and spreading news about all that Jesus had done for him, even though Jesus told him specifically not to. But this man couldn't resist telling everyone about the one who restored everything for him. But this also aided in making Jesus' popularity grow so much It was hard for our Lord to enter places without being completely overwhelmed. 
which clearly is what's taking place right here in our passage, which Mark in his gospel tells us takes place in a house in Capernaum. And in this house, according to Mark, we are told that people were inside packed like sardines. Well, he didn't use that exact wording. (laughs) That's my translation. Mark says it this way, that many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. So they were packed like sardines inside there. But they were packed in there to hear this, to hear the word. As they were crammed together in there, Mark says Jesus preached the word to them. Luke says in verse 17, he was teaching. You know, there are a lot of messages today, a lot of different messages going on in the world and unfortunately inside the church. But if this is what Jesus emphasized, I believe with all my heart that this is what we are to emphasize as well. You know, God's word is food for the soul. It nourishes. It's sweet, life-changing honey to our lips. And the very thing that equips us to walk strong in this world, no matter what is thrown our way. Can I get an amen to that? And the multitudes of people there in the house were pressing in. They were pressing in to hear the truth of God's word. All that it declared. Well, not quite everyone. Verse 17 again. It says, Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law. Notice, sitting by, as Jesus was teaching. Probably looking like this when they were sitting by, right? The common people would have been eating it up, engaged, and listening attentively to every word that went out. But these Pharisees and teachers of the law were probably scowling and looking around at Jesus and everyone else who was receiving the word. And these religious leaders keep going in verse 17, are ones who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Word has been spreading about Jesus. So leaders from all over Israel had been dispatched to check things out, which was not necessarily a wrong thing to do at first. I mean, a new teacher showing up on the scene and declaring to be from God is something they had a responsibility to evaluate. But when they heard the message he preached and saw the glorious works that followed, they should have realized real quickly that he was not only anointed, but he was the anointed one, the promised Messiah to come. Yet that's not what happened at all. (laughs) Throughout the Gospels, we see their, you know, their critical, skeptical, cynical attitude just constantly blossoming, right? And shining forth. Luke points out the Pharisees were there. He he specifies them. And most of us are familiar with the Pharisees and know that Jesus had some very tough words for them. Matthew 23, if you're interested, is a very good, insightful chapter on what Jesus had said about them. But though we know this group was quite flawed, to say the least, they actually started off with good intentions. The name Pharisee means separate ones, separate one, and they formed for that reason. What they want to do is they wanted to live that set-apart life unto God, grow in his word, and live according to it. But these spiritual leaders eventually abandoned the joy and delight of living for the Lord for legalism. For them, it became all about rules and regulations. And instead of pouring out compassion and motivating others to trust God, they laid burdens on the people and were completely absent of any grace or care for those they were supposed to tend to. They were also full of pride and arrogance. They carried a a holier-than-thou mentality and were no longer teachable or willing to receive which is why most of them would never acknowledge Jesus, but strive against him. So yeah, when Jesus was teaching and preaching the word in power, in the house with people, with sardines-packed people, I'm convinced these Pharisees looked like they were sucking on lemons the whole entire time. Can I simply encourage us? Don't emulate them. (laughs) Don't emulate them. They're, They're skeptical, burdensome behavior at all. If we see, which I dealt with before, if we see this prideful self-arrogance begin to bubble up where we think we know better than everybody, let's take it to the Lord (laughs) as quick as possible and ask him to change us. Because not only is that mentality ugly, I'm sure you've seen it, and foul to observe, but it leads to a place of spiritual decay and blindness 
to the beautiful things God is doing in people's lives, which is what we read here regarding these Pharisees in our passage. Notice the last statement of verse 17. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. God was moving in this house. And he was about to do something miraculous on so many levels. But as we'll see, their hard hearts blinded them to see the beauty of what was taking place right in front of them. They were blinded from seeing the Messiah right in front of them. We'll pick up with them again. But first we come to the situation with the man who was paralyzed. Look at verse 18. It says, Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, who they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Now, this is awesome, right? I mean, their actions in getting this man to Jesus is awesome. Well, maybe not so much for the people standing under the roof, right, at the time. And maybe not the homeowner either, as he looks at his precious house crumbling. No! Which could very well be Peter. What? This could be Peter's house. Now, the text doesn't say that, but so interesting, in Mark's account, this house is referred to not as a house, as in a random house, but the house. It's definitive, as in a familiar, recognized house. Well, by this point, the only house that, had been, that they'd been in before was Peter's house, when they healed Peter's mother-in-law. You remember that? That, and Mark was the one disciple who described the incident in the house with the most detail. Many scholars believe the gospel of Mark is from Peter's perspective. Mark is the shortest gospel. He usually gives the, the most concise descriptions. But for some strange reason, he is the writer who details this story the most, <laughs> including the specific damage to the house. So Peter's like, yeah, of course, <laughs> write down the incident, of course, if you have to. But would you jot down that what happens in my beautiful house at this time? <laughs> I mean, it could be Peter's house. We don't know. But if so, Peter's probably not initially too happy with what's taking place. But it didn't matter to the, to the people carrying this man. They were going to do all they could to get this man to Jesus. We read in verse 18 that he was brought on a bed. It's a, a kind of cot, like a stretcher, that the man was laying on. He was laying on it, which shows us that this man would never be able to make it to Jesus on his own. He was completely paralyzed. His body had no strength. His muscles could not support him in any way. There's no way he was walking to Jesus that day. This man was fully dependent on others for his life. I mean, think about it. From going anywhere, to eating, to bathing, even using the restroom, this man relied on the care of others for all matters of life. How many years was he like this? Is it five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? We're not told. How did he get paralyzed? Was he born this way? Did some disease that affected his nervous system cause it? Was it an injury to his neck and spinal cord that left him like this? Again, we don't know. Maybe there's some sort of an indication that this happened in his adult life because we read in verse 25, he has his own house. It could possibly, possibly be his parents' home, but his own makes it seem like it's his personally, that it belonged to him. And if that's true, what does that mean about his life? Did he once have a successful career? Does he have a wife that once he provided for, but now she has to tend to him every day, every one of his needs? Are kids in the picture who maybe once played catch with him and loved to jump on his back? like all kids do, as boys especially, I believe. <laughs> but now they have to see him lying there, 24-7, helpless. What was life before like? Again, how long has he been like this? We don't know. Many details are left out. But one thing we know is there has yet to be any medical treatment or physical therapy success to help this man, which must have left this man heartbroken, dwelling in thoughts of hopelessness and sorrow. But then there's Jesus, right? <laughs> the one who brings hope to the hopeless and joy to those who are grieved. Can I get an amen to that? And there are some passionate people who care enough about this man 
that they will do all they can to get him to Jesus. <laughs> Mark says the man paralyzed comes on the scene being carried by four men. I'm going to call them friends. I'm going to call them friends because they did everything they could to bring this man to Jesus. But this scene must have been crazy, right? I mean, picture it first, even at first. They must have heard Jesus was at that house and gone, we have to get this man to Jesus. We've got to get him there. So they pick him up and they travel there. But as they approach the house with this man in their arms, one on each corner of the bed, they quickly learn there's no way they can get him through the door because of the enormous crowd. And yet, instead of turning away, these friends get creative. I mean, could you imagine that conversation? <laughs> They're like, oh man, we can't get in. One of them must have gone, the roof. Could you imagine their expression? The, the roof, you want to take up the roof? Imagine the paralytic at this time. The, the roof, you want to take me up in the roof? What are you talking about the roof? I don't know if I like this whole business thing. I mean, can't we just schedule an appointment with Mrs. Peter for another day and come back when it's not so crowded? Can't we do something like that? I don't like this whole roof business. But these guys are determined. You know, one note, houses in the area at this time usually had a stairway that led up to the roof that was flat. So even though it would, it would still be difficult to carry a full-size man up there, it was doable. They didn't need to go to, like, the local Home Depot and rent a forklift or anything like that. They could carry him up. That was feasible. It was not, it was not cha that challenging. It would be heavy, but the, not that challenging. The challenging part was breaking through the roof. The typical roof of the day was constructed of wooden beams and clay and were packed with thick grass and twigs, making the roof up to two feet thick and really hard to break through. And again, there was no quick run to Home Depot to grab like an ancient jackhammer or anything like that or crowbar. These guys were using their hands and whatever they could find to shovel the rooftop to remove the roof. But they were persistent and these guys, they did it. They did it. <laughs> it must have been a sight from below, though, right? From the banging, what is that noise? To shoveling, to the yelling, just a little further, we almost got it, right? To seeing sunlight penetrate through the ceiling and a hole that was big enough to bring down a man and his bed. That must have been wild for all the people to see. But you got to love the wording at the end of verse 19, that these four men lowered the paralytic Right there it says, into the midst before Jesus. <laughs> These men use their strength. They use their time. They use their ability to get this man to Jesus. I call them friends. These are some friends, amen? <laughs> and what a picture of what we as the body of Christ are to do for one another, right? I mean, th think about the difference between these guys and those religious leaders who were supposed to be taking people, pointing them to God. The Pharisees were full of pride and self-elevation. But these men were willing to deny themselves to lift up another. Actually, to let down another, but you get the point. <laughs> they made such sacrifices, they were even willing to get in trouble <laughs> and possibly have to pay for the damages to Peter's house. It doesn't say that they did that, but they were willing to face consequences. But it was worth it for all four of them to get this man to Jesus, to bring him to hope and restoration and the abundance of life that is only found in Jesus. So much application here. For one, I think, if you know, if you find friends like this, <sighs> praise God for them. Because <laughs> you found something special. Also know that these are the kind of people you want to surround yourself with. Not people who will try and pull you away from Jesus, but those who will do all they can to take you to him. In their counsel and their advice and their encouragement for godly living, those whose answers will always get you closer to Jesus, those are the people you want to surround yourself with. And that's because those people know Jesus is the answer. For all things of life, they know. The answer for life is getting close to Jesus. Do you have people in your life like that? <laughs> when you're broken, when you're at your end, finding yourself desperate, and then you have those people that you can rely on, that you can rely on who will take you to Jesus.
not to themselves, not to something else, but to Jesus. If you have them, cherish them, cherish them. I'm thankful. Oh, my goodness. I am so thankful. I have people in my life when, when I'm going through it that I know, I know that I can reach out and they're going to pick up the phone. And they're going to spend time with me on the phone. And they're going to give me advice that was always going to point me to Jesus. Do you have people like that? You need people like that. We, need, we all need people like that. And let me just say, if you don't have people like that, get some people like that. <laughs> also say, there, there are some pretty incredible people in this room. <laughs> and I urge you to build some relationships. So number one, find friends who will take you to Jesus. But another application is, let's be these people <laughs> as well, right? That we care so much for others that, that whenever we're given an opportunity, let's always point them to Jesus. And I think not only even point them to Jesus, Let's pick them up and carry them to Jesus. You know, it might take some time. It might take some sacrifice. We even might miss a few minutes of MLB playoff baseball or something like that. But that's what we're called to do. And, and, and if you've ever been used in someone's life to encourage them in the Lord, you know, seeing people touched by Jesus, encouraged by him, maybe placing their trust in him for the very first time at salvation, or, or disheartened believers who you can help redirect back to the Lord, man, there's nothing like it. It's worth the time. It's worth the sacrifice. And it might take time. It might take, it might take creativity and determination. It might be even exhausting. But to see people commit and trust Jesus is worth it. Can anyone say amen to that? And the determination of these friends paid off because they lowered this man down on his bed and where he ended up was right there before Jesus. You know, there's a massive group, go, probably go, like first like this at Jesus, but then like uh, <laughs> when he, everything comes down. You know, the Pharisees are probably still like this the whole time with all that's going on. Peter and the missus probably cry, we're beautiful, you know. Guys looking down going, we hit the target, look, that was perfect. But let me ask you, what was Jesus like at this moment? I can't believe they interrupted my sermon. I was preaching it right now. I'm on fire. How dare they? I think Jesus was thrilled. I believe he had a big smile on his face. Maybe, maybe even a slight chuckle at this moment. As he sees this man come down, laid before him. He looks at him. Maybe he takes his eyes off and he looks back up at these guys. He looks at them sweating <laughs> and fatigued, but full of love. These full of love friends who successfully brought their friend to Jesus. Who did it because they believed Jesus was the answer for this man. And you know, Jesus is overjoyed. And he is looking at them because that's what we read in verse 20. It says, when he saw their faith, he said to the man, said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. Man, there's something incredible that happened. He sees what these, these guys have done. He sees their faith and how, how their faith brought this man to him. And then he looks at this man and says, your sins are forgiven you. It's incredible, right? <laughs> whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out. Is this saying their faith was what brought forgiveness of sins for this man? That, th that the man didn't really need to place his faith in Jesus but their faith was enough to cover this man as well as their own, their faith, and give him everlasting life. Is that what it's saying? Like, you know, some today might, might think and go, you know, my grandma, my grandma's super strong Christian, loved the Lord, all the evidence shows that she was dedicated to Jesus. Well, I'm her grandson. <laughs> Does that mean her faith in the Lord is enough to save me too? Even if I don't believe? Is something like that going on right here? I don't think so. I don't think so because that's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches we all need to personally believe. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
John 3, 16, when we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 3, each person must be born again. Each person must make the individual decision. We cannot get saved with other people's faith. We must personally place our faith in Jesus in order to be saved. So with this scene, I believe it's not that their faith saved this man, but it was that their faith brought this man to the place he had the opportunity to personally get saved by accepting Jesus. By faith, they physically brought the man to Jesus, and Jesus acknowledges that, but that was as far as they could take him. This man had to make the personal decision to respond and trust Jesus, which applies for us as well. We can have the faith to evangelize and share and shine and pray for open doors and soft hearts for those who need Jesus, and we absolutely should. That's what we are called to do. But the decision to follow Jesus by acknowledging their sin and placing their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior is only theirs to make. We can't make that for them. I mean, if it was, if all we had to do was pick up people and bring them to church, I mean, gosh, I would be working out every single day to be really stronger than everybody else. You just bring them in, then they get saved. But that's not what happens. And what takes place here is that these men, by their faith, they bring this man to this place. Jesus sees the faith of this, the, the men who did not back down, but with great effort brought this man to Jesus, as we are to do. But then Jesus turns his attention to the one paralyzed. And Jesus, looking right at this man, is able to see his greatest need, which is not outward physical healing, but his internal state spiritually. And being able to know exactly what was taking place inside of this man, as we see Jesus two verses from now doing with the evil thoughts of the Pharisees and what he can do in our hearts, he can look inside and penetrate us, Jesus reads this man, knows there's turmoil spiritually taking place inside, and says, man, your sins are forgiven you. <laughs> I Im imagine the friends looking down from above, hearing this and going, no, 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 that's not what we're asking for. <laughs> we wanted healing. We brought him here to be healed. And we're talking about forgiveness of sins. No, we want him to walk. We want him to walk so that his life would be changed forever. We want to see that miracle. Guess what? There's no greater miracle that will change your life forever than being healed spiritually. And there's only one person who can do it. <laughs> Which is why Jesus says these words to the man before he heals him. You know, physical healing is only temporary. If someone gets healed of something, guess what? Something's going to happen again. <laughs> it's going to happen again. These bodies are decaying. These bodies will fail physically. But true spiritual healing, the salvation of our soul, the forgiveness of sins will last for all eternity. And there will be physical healing one day in eternity, right? Forgiveness of sins is this man's greatest need, and I believe that when Jesus looks at this man, he sees the brokenness not physically, but spiritually. So Jesus brings comfort by saying, man, your sins are forgiven you. Matthew, interesting, records Jesus say to the man, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Showing this man wasn't full of cheer. He wasn't taking heart, but was full of guilt and shame. Jesus was setting him free of all of this in this moment. Now, could this man's paralysis have been caused by sin? It's possible, but the text doesn't say that. Nor does the Bible teach that all sickness or difficulty in life is because of sin or lack of faith, like some teach. I mean, if you read the story of the healing of the blind man in John chapter 9, you can see that's not true. The disciples asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus responds, neither this man nor his parents sinned. It says, he said, but, the works, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. The Bible doesn't teach that all health and life problems are necessarily the direct result of someone sinning. But the Bible does teach all people are sinners and are in need of a Savior. Jesus is the Savior, and he died in our place so we can all be forgiven of all our sins. This man's greatest need was forgiveness. And I don't know, but I, I believe in that moment, 
And he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. I believe he would have been happy with that. <laughs> that was enough. He'd be happy, happy to be carried off again. Because Come down, guys, and carry him off. He's forgiven of his sins. I believe he'd be happy because even if his circumstances didn't change, because he, his eternal status did. And of course, that's not the end of the story for him. But before we get to him again, the critical powders are at our forefront again. After Jesus con- uh, comforts and forgives the paralytic man, we read verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blas- blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now they were right on the second question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But they were incorrect about Jesus speaking blasphemies. Because Jesus is God. <laughs> and him being God gives him the right and authority to forgive sins. Verse 22, but when Jesus, look at this, perceived their thoughts. Notice, he, he, could, he could see what was taking place inside. When he perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? Now, which is easier to say? <laughs> Not which is easier to do. Jesus, it's hard for any, no one, it's possible for anyone to do except for Jesus. But which one's easier to say? Obviously, your sins are forgiven you, is easier to say because no one can see whether the transformation takes place or not, right? Your sins are forgiven you. No one can see. I mean, yes, out over time there's fruit, but re- initially no one can see if that takes place or not. While if one was to say to someone, rise up and walk, and they don't do it, well, there's some egg on your face, I think, mean, right? If someone says, rise up and walk, and the person tries and they can't, then it proves the person who said that had no power or authority to say that. But if they say, rise up and walk, and the person does it, then the, then the authority is proven to be there. And so Jesus says in verse 24, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. He says to the religious leaders that they would know he had power. And that word for power is the Greek word exousia which speaks of authority. It speaks of position to rule. It's the same word Jesus used in Matthew 28, the great suggestion. No, it's not the great suggestion. It's the great commission, right? Where he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The same thing. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Same, th- same word for authority there. He has all authority. And here in our passage, he says he has the authority to forgive sins. Notice verse 24, the son of man, he says. He calls himself the son of man. This is the first of over 20 times he refers to himself as that in Luke's gospel. It's his favorite title for himself used around 85 times in the New Testament. Why would he call himself the son of man here at the Pharisees? Why not the son of God? Why not Alpha and Omega, or from Isaiah 9, 6, mighty God? Why wouldn't he say that? He wouldn't say that because of Daniel 7, (laughs) verse 13, where Daniel gets a future prophetic vision of the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And the Son of Man is given dominion and a kingdom that consists of all peoples, nations, and languages worshiping him. And it says in the vision, quote, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Jesus uses the term because that's who he is. That's who he is. And he's telling them, I'm here. I'm here. His everlasting kingdom is coming, still yet future, but the son of man has arrived on the scene. And he's saying he has the authority upon the earth right now at this moment. And those Pharisees and teachers of the law would have known exactly what he's saying. <laughs> they would have known what that title means, and they, they would have known that Jesus was claiming to be the one from Daniel 7. And these re- religious leaders, they should have believed it. They should have believed all that he was teaching. They should have believed it then. They should have believed it when he said, man, your sins are forgiven you, that he had authority then. And when he said, rise and walk, they should have believed it. Which, shockingly, 
but not really. This man did, right? <laughs> Verse 25, it says, Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he was, had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. I mean, everyone was amazed by what Jesus did. But not everyone would come to give their life to him, especially the Pharisees. I mean, we're going to encounter them again, I, even soon. And, and Jesus will have some strong words for them. So enough about them. But what about this man? What about this man? Change forever. Change forever. And his change is showed by faith. Yeah, the faith of the guys to bring him there, but his faith had to come out too. He was brought to Jesus by faith of the men, but he exercised his own faith, which we see in verse 25. The end of verse 24, Jesus said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Verse 25, immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house glorifying God. The man had to get up. The man had to do it. The guys didn't rope down from there and then slowly bring him up. He said, you can get up. Let's help you up one foot at a time like Bambi or something, right? Like, I'm not doing that. It says he rose, and wa- he rose up immediately, immediately. Think about it. How long has he been like this? How long has he been in that state? How long has he been there? How weak was he? Muscles, gone. Strength of bones, gone. Joints, gone. He pops up <laughs> immediately. I don't know. Did, did his legs just like get buff in the moment? I don't know. It, it, was, it was amazing. So he pops up. And then I love how it, it, like immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had, been lying on, and departed his own house. It's like a piece later. <laughs> it's like, go, go. I'm not going to hang around. I'm going to go. And you know where he went, right? If he had a family, that's where he's going. He's grabbing hold of his wife again. He's throwing his, his kids on his back. I don't care if they're 40 years old. He's throwing them on his back again. This man was changed. Changed that moment. Spiritually first, but physically. He was healed, but above all, he was forgiven. And he was forgiven because Jesus has authority to forgive. He has all authority. He is the only one who has the authority who can forgive those on earth. which every person <laughs> needs to seek forgiveness from him. How was this man forgiven, though? He was brought to Jesus. These caring, loving friends did all they ca- could to bring this man to Jesus. I don't know if you, you, if you had influences before you came to Christ, but I'm so grateful for those people who planted seeds. <laughs> I'm so grateful for those who didn't go like this, but kind of did like that, you know? (laughs) Those conversations that I got into about that, how I do fall short of the glory of God, how I can't make it, how my good works can't outweigh my, that can't make it to heaven by having good works or the, the good works outweighing bad will make me okay or doing good things will get me to heaven. But, but spoke the truth. And were there to bring me. <laughs> I mean, I remember the day that I came, that I was brought to saving faith. Come to this New Year's Eve party. And I was seeking. I was broken inside. I was lost. I don't know if I believe all this. I believe the church is a bunch of hypocrites. I'll go. And then when I realized Jesus did all he did, and he did it for me, a wretch like me, I asked him to come in. You think about those people in your life. Let's be those people too, right? Sometimes we'll be annoying. Don't be too annoying. (laughs) man, we know the end for those who don't come to saving faith. We know all people live forever. 
but it's where they're going to live that matters. Are we exhausted? Are we willing to make those sacrifices, to make the sacrifice our time, to care enough that we would bring people to Jesus? I think this shows us we should. <laughs> if we're friends, we're going to take people to the Lord. We're going to make that the priority. Not just football buddies. Football buddies we want to see know Jesus. Football buddies that we want to see spend eternity with Jesus. Spend eternity with us because that's where we're going to be, <laughs> with Jesus for all eternity. But what about you? What, what are you? Where are you at? What's taking place inside? Do you know the Lord? Have you repented of your sins? Do you realize that there you are a sinner in need of a Savior? That you have broken the law? You've fallen short. You can't make it on your own. But that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus left eternity and walked, was born into this world, walked this earth, died the most brutal death imaginable, marred more than any man, so that we could have everlasting life, so we could be forgiven of our sins. And you know what? He has the authority to forgive us. <laughs> and he is willing to do it. Are you willing to come to him? Open your heart to him. Ask him to come in. Turn from your, your sins. Turn towards him. And allow him to work in your life. He's willing to do it. He wants to do it. Lord, thank you so much for your love. I just thank you for this time together, Lord, that we could come into your house and Lord, that we can be in awe of you. Lord, I, I pray that we wouldn't just be in awe that you have done great things, Lord. As the, the people in the house, how many came to saving faith that day? I don't know. But we know this man was forgiven. And Lord, I, I just pray if anyone doesn't know you today, that they know that all their, their sins, all the turmoil that takes place, all the distance, the broken relationship with you can be healed if they acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. If they turn from their sins confess you. Lord, believe in you. Believe you came, died, buried, rose, ascended in glory. I pray that if anyone is struggling, Lord, in life, or maybe some of us in here too, or have turmoil inside and we haven't realized, God, that you're there to heal that too. Would you heal? Would you work? Help us to see, Lord, that you're on the throne. You have all authority, which means, Lord, you have the power to bring peace to our hearts. Would you do that today, Lord? If someone doesn't know you, maybe open their heart, even this last song. For those of us who are broken, Lord, come on in again. Fill us anew. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this time. You're so worthy of all our praise. Powerful. We glorify you. In Jesus' name. Will you please stand? Let's go out singing to our great, awesome Lord.